Section 13.3, I'm going to discuss the law of conservation of energy. There are certain quantities that when the, uh, a system evolves, when, uh, when things in the system move about, there are certain uh, properties that don't change. And we refer to these properties as conserved quantities. And conserved quantities include things like mass. You probably saw in chemistry that the, uh, the, the amount of mass that a system starts with uh, before a chemical reaction occurs is the same mass that the system has after the chemical reaction occurs. Therefore, mass is conserved. What you start with is what you end with. Energy follows the same pattern. Momentum. Next unit, we're going to look at uh, the conservation of momentum. And if you continue studying physics after this course, you'll probably uh, run into electric charge. That's another conserved quantity. There's, uh, there's many more other conserved quantities. Conservation laws are a really important idea throughout all of physics. And conservation laws are important because they allow us to make certain predictions about either the initial or final conditions of a system where we don't really have to be concerned about the nitty gritty details of what happens between the initial and final positions, uh, provided we understand uh, the forces uh, acting on the system and whether they're adding or removing energy from the system. Now, when we're talking about the conservation of energy, we have to be aware of whether our system is either gaining or losing energy. So the law of conservation of energy is just a statement that if we track the energy changes of a system, that we can, uh, we can make predictions about uh, either the initial or final conditions. So uh, we can add energy to our system if, we, if work is done on the system. Uh, the system can lose energy if uh, a non-conservative force like friction or drag removes energy. And uh, energy within the system can change form between kinetic and potential, potential and kinetic. Potential energies can trade back and forth. But if we look at uh, all of the energy changes, we can account for the total mechanical energy in the system. We can look at the initial total mechanical energy. And then we can look at the work and loss. Work is added energy, loss is removed energy, and when you uh, subtract the loss from the work, you get the change in the total mechanical energy. So what you start with plus the amount that it changes is what you end with. Okay, so conservation of energy is all about just tracking the energy in and out of a system. In this section, we're going to look at the special case where work and loss are both zero. So in this special case where there's no energy being added, there's no energy being removed, the amount of energy that, that the system starts with is going to be constant. And so uh, the energy can trade between the different forms, but the total amount is going to remain the same. And if the total amount is constant, in physics we refer to that, uh, that quantity, in this case total mechanical energy, as being conserved. Conserved means the total amount stays constant. And we'll see that in a few examples. So in this example we have a 50 kilogram swimmer at a height of four meters above the bottom of the slide, and uh, she's going to slide down uh, the slide into the water. So part A wants us to identify the types of energy present in the system and to calculate the amount of energy in the swimmer earth system. So notice that there is no uh, spring or elastic type of material, so uh, uh, elastic potential energy is going to be zero. It's not going to be something that we need to consider in this problem. The system is starting from rest. Therefore, the initial kinetic energy is zero. So we start with zero elastic potential, zero kinetic, but the swimmer is at a raised position, so there will be gravitational potential energy. And last section, we, um, we introduced the formula for this. It is mass times G times H. We're given the mass of the swimmer 
50 kilograms. We know G near the surface of the Earth is 10, and the height is given as 4. So the system starts with a gravitational potential energy of 2,000 joules. And if we add up the three types of energy, elastic potential, kinetic, and gravitational potential energy, we end up getting a grand total of 2,000 joules to start with. So as the swimmer uh, moves down the slide, we're ignoring drag, and it is a frictionless slide. There's no force pushing on the swimmer. Therefore, work is zero, loss is zero, therefore the total mechanical energy is going to be, uh, is going to remain 2,000 joules. So at the bottom of the slide, at the bottom of the slide, uh, the total mechanical energy still has to be 2,000 joules. At the bottom of the slide, the gravitational potential energy becomes zero because now she gets to that reference level. So that means that all of the energy had to turn from gravity potential into kinetic. So the swimmer maintains the total amount, loses all of the potential energy that's stored in the system. That potential energy transforms into kinetic energy. And if we know the amount of kinetic energy, we can, uh, we can calculate the speed because kinetic energy is related to speed. If we have 2,000 joules of kinetic energy and we know that the mass is 50 kilograms, we can solve for the speed and the swimmer's speed is going to be 8 0.94 meters per second. Okay, continuing on with the same example. If instead now of a straight slide, how would the swimmer's speed change if the slide was curved, right? If it looked like this. Well, the, 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 the important idea in conservation of energy is that what's happening between the initial spot at the top of the slide and the bottom of the slide doesn't really matter. It just matters what type of energy we start with. And we started with a total mechanical energy that was all gravitational potential energy uh, being 2,000 joules. That those 2,000 joules uh, remained, so the total mechanical energy was still 2,000, but now the, uh, the energy is all kinetic. Nothing about the, those statements have changed with changing the shape. The only real difference is this is going to uh, take less time because the swimmer is going to pick up speed earlier and maintain that large, fast speed throughout the uh, motion. But nothing about the uh, energy changes, so there is no change in speed due to changing the shape of the track. Well, what if she was a different mass? What if she was heavier or lighter? Well, notice that gravitational potential energy, which was MGH, well, gravity potential energy is directly proportional to the mass. So if we were to double the mass, we would double the energy. But, big but here, kinetic energy, which is half mass speed squared, kinetic energy is also directly proportional to mass. And so uh, that means that the increase or decrease in the initial energy is going to uh, sort of be a push uh, with kinetic energy. The kinetic energy will increase or decrease by the same relative amount. And you can see that if we consider gravity potential initial is kinetic energy final, 
We saw this throughout the problem. Initial gravity uh, potential energy is mgh. Final kinetic energy is half mv squared. You see a mass here and a mass here. Masses are going to cancel. The only things that affect the final speed are the strength of gravity, which isn't changing, and the initial height, which is the same uh, between the two uh, uh, between the two uh, situations, the uh, first swimmer and the swimmer with a different mass. In our last example, we have an archer who draws his bow, storing 100 joules of energy. He releases the 100 gram arrow horizontally from a cliff that's 20 meters tall. We are to ignore drag. Part A asks us to quantify the energy of the bow arrow earth system prior to the archer releasing the bow. So we want to calculate all the types of energy and then add them up. We'll start with gravitational potential energy. The arrow earth system will have gravitational potential energy because the arrow is going to start above the reference level. And we can calculate that gravitational potential energy by multiplying mgh. We're given the mass of the arrow, but the mass of the arrow is in grams. So we have to divide that by 1,000 to turn that into kilograms. So 100 grams is 0 0.1 kilograms. We're going to multiply that by G, the strength of gravity, which is 10. And we're going to multiply that by the initial height of the arrow, which is given as 20 meters. So when we uh, multiply these out, that equals 20 joules of energy. The kinetic energy of the arrow is going to be zero because before the arrow is released, the arrow is not moving, therefore it has zero kinetic energy. And it's stated in the problem that the bow is storing up uh, 100 joules of elastic potential energy. And we can find the total mechanical energy in the system by summing the kinetic and potential energies that are present in the system and so we have 0 plus 20 plus 100 for a total of 120 joules so the system is starting with 120 joules Part B wants us to quantify the energy of the bow arrow earth system as the arrow is leaving the archer's bow. When the arrow leaves the uh, archer's bow, the elastic potential energy is going to become zero because the bow is then going to be relaxed. The bow, uh, or rather the arrow, has not really changed uh, its height, so the gravitational potential energy is going to remain the 20 joules that it was uh, before it was released. However, the, uh, there is no uh, force that is doing work for, uh, on the system and there is no loss of energy. Therefore, the total mechanical energy has to remain the same. It still has to be 120 joules. Okay? But the elastic energy uh, dropped to zero. It was 100 and now it's zero. So where did that energy go? Well, it just changed form. It changed form into kinetic energy. So we just swapped uh, elastic potential for kinetic energies. And then at, for part C, we want to find the energy of the bow arrow earth system as the arrow is landing. Again, uh, there's no there's going to be no forces adding energy doing work on the system. And so the total mechanical energy needs to remain 120 joules. The elastic potential energy is zero because the bow is relaxed. And when the arrow lands on the ground, it's then going to be at the reference level. That means that gravitational potential energy is going to drop to zero. So what happened to the energy? Well, we still have 120 joules, but now all of it is going to be kinetic energy. Okay. So the thing to, uh, to note 
for this for this example is that the total energy remained the same throughout. Energy was conserved in this problem because there were no non-conservative forces doing work. There were no forces like friction or drag to remove energy and cause a loss of energy. All right, in parts D, E, and F, we're asked some follow-up questions. So in part D, we want to find the arrow's speed when it leaves the bow. Well, for this, we want to take advantage of the kinetic energy and speed relationship. Okay, the kinetic energy of the arrow depends on the arrow's speed. And when the arrow left the bow, we determined that its kinetic energy would be 100 joules. We were given the uh, mass of the arrow. It was 0.1 kilograms. And so we can solve this for the speed. Uh, if I simplify this a little bit, we end up getting 2,000 is the speed squared. And then we end up having to take a square root of both sides to get the speed. And the square root of 2,000 is 44.7. And we're calculating a speed here. So speed is measured in meters per second. Part E is going to be very similar. We're going to use, again, the kinetic energy and speed equation. But now we're finding the speed when the arrow lands. And the kinetic energy of the arrow had increased from 100 to 120 joules. Therefore, we should expect the uh, speed to be greater. Uh, again, simplifying the equation just a little bit, I get 2400 is the speed squared. Again, I take the square root of both sides, and that will give me just about 49 meters per second. All right, and the last one, uh, part F. Would there be a difference in the arrow's energy during its journey if it had a different mass? So for part F, we just want to consider, well, what's going into the total mechanical energy? We had elastic potential that got stored in the bow. We had kinetic and we had gravitational potential energy. Now, when the problem started and the arrow was still in the bow, it had elastic potential energy, uh, but that had no dependence on mass. We did, it, it, the, the elastic potential energy does not depend on the mass of the, uh, the arrow. It depends on the properties of the bow, how strong the bow is and how, uh, how far the, uh, the archer had uh, stretch the bow. The kinetic energy uh, does depend on the mass, but the kinetic energy was zero to start with. So the only contribution, the only thing that changes about the energy due to changing the mass would be the gravitational potential energy. And remember that gravity potential is equal to mgh, therefore it is proportional to the mass. So if we would, for example, double the mass, we would double the gravitational potential energy. Now, that wouldn't exactly double the total energy because we have some uh, stored up initial energy. But increasing the mass would cause an increase in the gravitational potential energy, which would increase the total mechanical energy. And remember, throughout the journey of the arrow, uh, the total mechanical energy stored in the system remained constant. So the total energy would be the same, uh, would be the same throughout the journey, and increasing the mass would increase that total mechanical energy. When the arrow is released, uh, that'll elastic potential energy becomes kinetic, and then as the arrow falls, the gravity potential energy becomes kinetic. And so when the arrow lands, it's all kinetic energy. All of that initial, en uh, initial energy becomes kinetic. And again, because we had increased the initial energy, we would increase the final kinetic energy which would mean that it is uh, landing with more kinetic energy.
That concludes the 13.3 uh, the lecture. In 13.4, we're going to continue talking about conservation of energy, but then we're going to add in one more detail where non-conservative forces are doing work. And I'll see you in lecture 13.4.